Hi, that was wonderful. I don't have time to go off on one of my pet peeves, uh, so I'm not going to go off on just mention. My wife and I were in a restaurant yesterday, and they had music, well, they had noise uh, blaring away and had people uh, making noise with the instruments that we wouldn't dare let sing in our church because they just don't have the talent to do anything but and yell and stuff. And to see a man that's a man come to the pulpit, sing like a man, communicate the message, boy, isn't that a blessing. Amen. It's almost a lost art in many places in our country. Well, you're not uh, as excited about that as I am, but, may, but anyway, man, I appreciate that. I haven't heard that song in years. That is a beautiful song, well communicated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to come. Brother Barber, it's good to see you. Good to see Brother Weaver. Good to see Brother Rigsby, even. Huh? Isn't that a blessing? I was quite shocked a while ago when he asked uh, the gentleman, to Brother Daniel, to come and pray. Because in Sunday school, he admitted that he had problems. He was leading, uh, bringing in the sheaves. And he said the worst whooping he ever got in church when he was a kid was for singing, swinging in the breeze. And, uh, and he should have got a whooping. Somebody say amen. So anyway, I was really shocked that you trusted him to come. And, uh, and yeah, I can tell he's, he's okay with this. All right. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, if you would please. The Gospel of Matthew and chapter number 13. Um, I appreciate the, uh, as I said, the privilege to come and to preach. I'd like for my wife to stand. Sandra, if you don't mind uh, standing together, this has been my uh, help meet for the past 50, 52 years. And um, this past summer, we just uh, acknowledged uh, 51 years together in the full-time ministry and I want to thank God for her love for the Lord and even for her husband and her faithfulness to God is a real blessing. Uh, last week, Pastor said that it was a group uh, called Witness from Heartland Baptist Bible College, and I'm sure they had music. And if you didn't get any of the music from Heartland last week, we have a table set up in the foyer. I'm not going to spend time talking about it or promoting, just to say that we're there. It's some really, really good music that will be a help and be a blessing to you. There's quartet, trios. Uh, choir numbers, there's a 20 year anniversary of some of our best music over the past 20 years and we'd be more than happy to accommodate you there, my wife and I'll be at the table at the end. If you don't mind standing with me for the reading of the word in uh, Matthew and chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> and the scripture says, verse 1, the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and mark this now, great multitudes, not multitudes, great multitudes, were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship, and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And verse 5 said that some seed fell by the stony places, and then verse 7, some fell among thorns, and in verse number 8, other fell into good ground. Amen. Verse 9, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? And Jesus answered in verse number 11 to verse 13, please. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, or Isaiah, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. 
But blessed, he said to his disciples in answering their question, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. And then in verse 20, he talks about what happened to the seed that fell into stony places, among thorns, and on the good ground. So just by the way we have read the text this morning, you can tell probably that we're going to put emphasis on the seed that fell by the wayside. And I would like to preach for the next few moments about understanding the wayside heart. Understanding the wayside heart. So Father, we ask your blessings once again upon this time. Thank you for the prayers that have been offered before today and certainly in our services and our time together this morning. Thank you for your people. Thank you for every member of Worth Baptist Church, and thank you for the singing this morning to lift our voices together and praise you and to be ministered to so well by song as well. It's such a blessing to us, and we, we don't weary of it. Thank you for it. Now, I pray that you would bless our time in the Word. I pray, O oh God, that when all is said and done, that it would be so that I have stood before people that have ears to hear and hear. And eyes to see and see. And I pray, O oh God, that you would work in such a way that no one would walk out the door with their heart well on the way to being a wayside heart. And so I pray that you would help me. Give me clarity and plainness of thought and give your people, as I said, and as your word implores, hearing ears, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and God bless you. you may be seated. As you read through the Gospels, you cannot but be impressed by the fact that the multitudes came and came again and kept coming and Jesus and his disciples seemed to be constantly dealing with the multitudes. And indeed, his fame was spread abroad and people were coming because not only of the power of his words, but because some were fed. Miraculously, they were fed. Others were healed. Multitudes were healed. Not just a good number of them. Multitudes were healed of all manner of affliction and disease as Jesus went about manifesting his power over every realm of existence. And what I mean by that is he cast out demons, calmed the storms and the waves of the sea, he spoke and the dead came back to life again. Lepers were cleansed, blind eyes opened, deaf ears unstopped, the lame were made to walk. And you just imagine any kind of affliction that might come upon a man and Jesus dealt with that and was of the power to heal and his fame spread abroad and the multitudes just kept coming. Now, I'm a Baptist preacher, been trying to be one for over 50 years now. And I just have to say, I'd, I'd rather preach to a crowd than not. In other words, I'd rather preach to, I, I'm glad to see people in these pews, I'd rather preach to people in pews than, than to the pews. Now, I've had a good time in an auditorium all by myself preaching to pews, but I like it better this way. And uh, we're impressed with the crowd. Everybody's impressed with the crowd. Uh, 
whenever there is some kind of a big rally in Washington, D.C., or various places here in our country, around the world, you'll see an aerial view of it, and you can see the multitudes that are there, and we're, we're impressed by that. My soul, look at the massive humanity that is there. Football stadiums all around the country yesterday were filled with football fans. The Goodyear blimp is here and there, and they're showing those aerial views. And, and people are impressed with multitudes. The last time I got to go to an Oklahoma game, I've been a Sooner fan all of my life and lived within an hour, hour and a half of the place, and I've already been to five games. And the last one I went to, I was there with my son, and they were playing Texas A&M. And so it was about time for the game to start. There were 84,000 people there. And as the game was getting ready to start, it must have been a, team, a TV timeout or something because nothing was going on. We're just sitting there in the north end zone, and my son and I were looking at the crowd. And I said to my son, Samuel, I would love to have the microphone here for one hour. Just one hour. And he looked at me like, what's that about? And, and actually, if we're serious about who we are as Christians, you don't first look on a mass of humanity like that. You don't first look out and see 85,000 fans. You don't think that way. If we're serious about being a Christian, we see 85,000 souls. And every one of them, according to the authority of the Bible, are going to spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. And if I'm at all serious about my life as a Christian, then I, I know how they can have their sin forgiven. I know how they can have eternal life. And they, every one, need the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'd like to have the microphone for that purpose for one hour. Now, my son's kind of a smart aleck. He said, Dad, you'd need it for two hours. <laughs> okay, I'll take it for two hours. Since we're just wishing anyway, I'd be happy to have it for two hours. But it, indeed, we look at the masses of humanity all over the place. There were other places not so delightful as Norman, like Michigan and Ohio State and places like that, Notre Dame, where there's 120,000 people assembled there, you know, and you look upon the multitudes, every one of them. Yeah, it's an impressive crowd, all right, but every one of them need the gospel. You, you know, I, I get that from reading this account because Jesus uh, was in this boat and he was going to address the people and great multitudes came. Now, if I just said multitudes, if you do a little word study, you'll see that if I said multitudes and we measured it like this, there were multi multitudes there. But when we say great multitudes, it's like this. And so it wasn't like there was a nice crowd. There, was, uh, there were great multitudes there. There's no hyperbole there. You can't always trust a Baptist preacher to evaluate a crowd, but you can trust Jesus to evaluate a crowd. And there were great multitudes that were present there, weren't there? Absolutely. And when Jesus looked upon the multitudes, you might notice that he never did say to his disciples, we have a good crowd here today, don't we? Look how many people have come to hear my words and to see my works uh, that I do of my Father. He didn't talk like that. Or rather, when Jesus looked at the multitudes, here's what he saw. He saw soil. That's what he saw. He stood before great multitudes, and he saw soil. And as Jesus looked, he saw that there was soil that needed seed. So in the parable, we'll not spend a lot of time trying to explain it, but in the parable, it becomes very clear that Jesus is looking at the crowd, the mass of humanity, the great multitudes that were there. Jesus is looking at them, and he sees the hearts of men as soil. The words that he spoke were the seed, and he was the sower. So any way you want to look at this, you study the passage and you can see very clearly that Jesus considered himself to be the sower. He considered the words that he spoke to be the seed and he considered the hearts of men to be the soil that should receive the seed. And so when Jesus began to speak, he said, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now I'm not going to argue with anybody about it. I'm not, I, I, if you disagree with what I'm about to say, I think we can still be friends but I'm kind of persuaded in my own heart 
that Jesus, being the master of the metaphor and the master of the parable, the master teacher, the master of the visual aid, wouldn't surprise me at all if Jesus didn't look over on a hillside by the Sea of Galilee and there was a farmer out in the field and tilled the soil with a bag over his shoulder and he was sowing the field and he's holding the bag open with this hand, reaching in with the other hand if he's a right-handed man and he is meticulously and skillfully sowing the seed in that field. That's the way they sowed. Then somebody would come along with another instrument, the seed would go onto the soil, the rain would come, it would germinate and the wheat would grow. And so Jesus said, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And I can just see everybody, because behold means, well, look at this. And so I can just see everybody's head turning of this great multitudes, and they looked over there, and sure enough, there was the man out there sowing. And so Jesus began to talk to them in a parable. And he knew that in that great multitude, not everybody was going to receive the seed. He knew that it would not all bring forth the same kind of fruit. I mean, my dad was a, a wheat farmer up in north central Oklahoma. That's how I was raised. It's still in my blood. I love it. I love to talk about it and all that. But I can just tell you right now, the largest field that we uh, farmed, I've taken my wife by it many times, as though she's interested, but I've taken her by many times, and I've talked about the soil that's there. There's this loamy soil here and stony soil there and bottom soil that's really going to produce over here and some clay soil over here. Jesus looked at the multitude, and lo and behold, he saw that there is some good soil out there, but there's some also there are thorns that are going to choke out the seed. There's some rocky places that won't provide any depth. And then there is the wayside that we're going to focus on this morning. What is the wayside? Oh, I think just the name probably says it for many. But the wayside would be that part that is traveled on. In our part of the country, our properties, our farms, and our fields are divided by fences. In those days, they would have primarily been divided by a path between this farmer's field and this farmer's field. So then when it came time to work the field, then the workers and the oxen and the donkeys and the carts and everything that would have been used would have traveled down this road and then come to the field and they would share this path in between their fields. And the workers and the, uh, the, workers and the uh, oxen and the carts and the donkeys and everything that they would use, it, they would go in on that path. This farmer would work this side and this farmer would work that side. Now the interesting thing is, is that soil that we call the path there was no different than the soil on either side except for one thing. By the foot of men and by the foot of beast and by the wheels of carts, it is passed over time and time and time again. And you don't have to be a scientist to figure this out. You know that once uh, it has been traveled over time and time again, something happens to that soil, now doesn't it? And what happens to that soil, it becomes very hard. Like the dirt road that I was raised on. Back before they did any rock on the road or sand on the road or certainly paving on the road, it was just a dirt road. And I can't tell you how many times there were times like we've had uh, this fall where rains would come and, and that, that dirt road would just become a quagmire. And uh, 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 neighbors would come by. My daddy would keep his tractor ready because neighbors would come by and they'd be stuck down here somewhere. And my dad would go and help pull them out or oil field trucks. We'd pull out oil field trucks and farmers and stuff like that. And can you imagine how difficult it was for me as a boy that was thirsting for an education and the bus was stuck somewhere and never came by my house that day. What a bad day like that. And then after a while, that old muddy road, uh, sun would come out and it'd dry up and the county grader would eventually come out and he'd smooth out all the ruts and take care of the road and then it was smooth again and it was fun to ride a bicycle on right then and there. But before long, it's traveled over and traveled over and traveled over and it could become as hard as this pulpit right here. And that's what happens in the wayside. Now when the sower is out there sowing, as he sows, he wants to make sure that every bit of that which might produce is covered with seed. So in so doing that, some of the seed would spill over by their method of sowing. Some of their seed would spill over onto the wayside, and there it would lay. The other in soft ground, it might even start disappearing right there. But the other seed that fell on the wayside, no, it's just going to lay there. And our text says that the evil one is like a bird that comes along and steals it away. But we know this, that if no bird comes along, as long as that seed is lying on that hard soil, nothing is going to happen. 
It is not going to produce. And the reason it's not going to produce is because it cannot penetrate the soil. It cannot find the moisture. It cannot develop roots. It cannot grow. And it just lies there on the wayside. Now, we understand that in relation to dirt. We understand that in relation to the farmer that is out sowing. But what does this have to do with the human heart? Because Jesus obviously is not giving a lesson in agriculture here. He is talking about the hearts of men. And as he looked upon the multitudes, he cared about the hearts of men. And they desperately needed it. Hey, friend, they desperately needed what he had to say. They desperately needed to know who he is and why he came. They desperately needed to know that there was salvation that was available. They desperately needed to know that. And so he sowed the seed knowing full well some is going to fall on the wayside. Now in order to really get a hold of this, we have to be faithful to the scripture and understand that in verse number 13 where we read, you could have started back in verse number 11, but in verse 13 we have to bring, our, now please don't let me lose you right here, it's so important. We have to bring Israel into the picture. The Jews, the nation of Israel, they are in the picture. Because if you look in verse number 13, Jesus said, Therefore speak I to them in parables. Now watch this, please. Because they seeing, who's they? We're going to see. Because they seeing, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them, so they is them. Everybody with me here? I said, who is they in verse number 13? Well, it's the same as them in verse number 14. That doesn't sound like good grammar, but I'm just trying to get us to see the connection here. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Oh, now we know who them is. No, let's see. That's not the way to say it. We know who they are, don't we? Well, we know who they and we know who them is. And verse 14, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah or Isaiah. So Jesus is talking about the, look, the people that made up that multitude that would be the same people to which Isaiah prophesied 800 years before. No, no, they didn't live that long, but from one generation to another generation to another generation, if you study the Bible at all, you'll see that the way of the fathers was passed on from one generation to another generation to another generation. Can I get this across to you this morning? So that the problem that Isaiah dealt with in his day 800 years before Jesus was no different than when Jesus was here and preaching like Isaiah said he would. And their hearts are in the same condition. Now look at verse number 14. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah which said, by hearing, here's what Isaiah dealt with, Jesus now deals with. The same race of people, he came into his own, his own received him not. I'm not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Come on, Jesus first went to his own people. And he went to the Jews and these multitudes were Jewish people that had come from everywhere Jews were. And they had come there to hear Jesus. And he said in verse number 14, In them, in this people to whom I preach, is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. And here's what he said. There, by hearing they shall hear, but not understand. Seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. So what was the condition of people in Isaiah's day? Whatever it was, it's the condition of people in Jesus' day. And here was their condition. Can I have your attention? They had eyes, but they didn't see. And they had ears, but they didn't hear. They could have, should have, understood, but they didn't understand. That was their spiritual condition. Eyes, but don't see? Yeah. I, mean, I go through this all the time. This morning, trying to find a certain item in my little suitcase there. Saying to my wife, where is that? What would you do with that? <laughs> then here I am. So I went back to the suitcase again, and there's where it was. When did you put this in here? Well, I'd probably look at it three times and didn't see it. Does anybody else have issues like that? You don't have to be old to have those issues. You can just be easily distracted, and your mind's going here, and your mind's going there, and you're seeing, but you're not seeing. I do it in a grocery store all the time. 
Does anybody know what it is to hear but not hear? Are you married? <laughs> then you know what it is, and you've been challenged about it, haven't you? You didn't hear a word I said. I heard everything you said. What would you say? Yeah, well, I heard you. Well, you heard the sound, but you weren't hearing. Is that right? Come on, friends. Some of you are looking so innocent right now, but I know human nature, and that's how it is. We have the ability to see but not see. We have the ability to hear and not hear. And there are things we don't understand because we simply have not paid attention. Isn't that right? And Jesus is talking to a nation of people that he said, they have eyes to see but they don't see and ears to hear but they don't hear. Now this isn't one of those deals where, well, they can't see? No. Well, bless their heart. I had a guy down in Georgia say, you can say anything you want to people in the South as long as you add, bless your heart. And so they have ears to hear but don't hear. They can't, they can't hear? No. Well, bless their heart. No, this is not a bless your heart moment. Because they have eyes to see, but they choose not to see. They have ears to hear, but they don't hear. That's why the prophet Isaiah said that they have covered their eyes and closed their ears, and they have refused to hear. To, to pay attention or understand what God is saying. If I can just get you, because it's here, it, I mean, it's right here in our text. If I can get us to go back and think about the times of the prophets. And when the prophets came, you know that when the prophets came, they began their message by what? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. That he never came and said, you know, I've been thinking about this, and my opinion is. That's not what the prophets did. The prophets came by and they said, thus saith the Lord. And you understand, too, that God, with some of his prophets, went to great lengths to make sure they could understand. I mean, he put his own prophets through some incredible circumstances at times just so they could address the people in a way that they would understand. And so the prophet would come, and the prophets were to lift up their voice like a trumpet and cry out. And the prophets were men that had, I mean, they had preach in them. They didn't come by with a little passive attitude. Well, I've got to pick up my paycheck Friday, and so I'm going to come by and tell you so I can be sure and get paid. Now, that's not the kind of men that they were, ladies and gentlemen. They came by with a burden, and in fact, a lot of times their message said, the burden of the Lord as was given to this or that prophet. The burden, the burden. And they had this passion, and they had this burden, and they would preach, and they would preach. I mean, I'm thinking about Jeremiah. I'm thinking about Zephaniah. I'm thinking about Isaiah. I'm thinking about Ezekiel. I'm thinking about... Micaiah. I'm thinking about great prophets, Elijah, and on and on. And they would come and preach and they would speak, thus saith the Lord. And I can just see some of them like, like prophet type preachers do now. Folks, do you hear me? Can you see what I'm saying? And I can hear the prophet saying, do you see it? No, we don't see it. Well, bless your heart. No, not bless your heart. They are not seen because they don't want to see did you hear what I said? I can hear a prophet saying, no, unfortunately, we didn't hear that because their ears were stopped and their eyes were covered and they refused to see. And Jesus said that in that process, their hearts became like wayside soil. Now look in verse number 14, if you would. Check this out. Verse 15. For this people's heart, look at this, is waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Can I have your attention up here? Jesus said, this people's heart is waxed gross. What does that mean? Sounds gross, doesn't it? This people's heart is waxed gross. Simple, hardened, calloused. Did you ever have calluses on your hands? The way I was raised up, I always had calluses. I was picking at calluses all of my days. Quit picking at your calluses, my mom would say. Okay. Pick at them some more. Always had calluses. Why? From working. I don't work anymore. I don't have calluses now. But from working, doing the same thing. Before they started shooting all these buildings together, guys would take hammers and they would have calluses on their hand from holding a hammer and doing farm work. And I can remember my brothers saying to me, eight and ten years older than me, and they would say to me, sissies wear gloves. Real men don't wear gloves. 
and found out they were wearing them when I didn't know it, but I didn't. And so they were trying to make a man out of me, right? And so I had these calluses on my hands all the time. It's from doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Mom put a mandolin in my hand and said, you're going to play this mandolin. I don't know how to play a mandolin. She said, I didn't say you did. I said, you're going to. So I started learning how to play a mandolin. Not enough to let anybody hear it, but I started messing around on a mandolin. A few years ago, I got the mandolin out, and I said to my wife, I think I'll pick some more. And she said, oh, couldn't tell if she was enthused about it or what. And so I got it out, and I tuned it up with a piano, but it was out of tune too. So, you know, I'm, I know it didn't sound exactly right, but I tuned it up the best I could, and I started picking away and singing, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through, and I was cording and picking a little bit and just doing a good job, got through verse 1, part of verse 2, and I stopped. What would you stop for? I, I don't like painting. I hadn't played. My fingers are soft. And, you know, through one song, and my fingers are hurting. Well, keep playing, and they'll get calloused. I don't like pain, so I never did play again, so I haven't at all. But if you do the same thing, musicians know that. Do the same thing over and over and over again, and you get those calluses. The end of your fingers are going to be like hard as a rock. And that's the way the heart is. But that's the way Jesus said the heart of man is. That some of this seed is going to fall by the wayside. Some of this seed is going to fall upon hearts that are waxed gross. Some of this seed is going to, or it will fall upon hearts that are callous. Some of these are going to be as hard as the wayside. And how does it get hard? By hearing and not seeing. A hearing and not hearing. By being told over and over and over again. Only to reject what God said. And all the while. The heart of man is getting hard. And it's an ugly sight. It's a sad sight. Remember a man named Roy? I wasn't the only one to witness to Roy, but I was probably the last one. Emphysema, carried oxygen all the time. Now a weakened and frail man. I talked to him three, at least three times. And pled for his soul. Not now. No, not now. No, not now. The last time at his house he said, I'm not going to get saved. Brother Sam, he called me. I'm not going to be saved tonight, Brother Sam. But I promise you this, before I die, I will. I said, Roy, you can't make that promise. I sure can. I'm a man of my word. And I'll keep the promise. Wasn't long till. His daughter called, his long story there, and I went up to the hospital and went in there to talk to Roy, and he's unconscious. Well, he's asleep, I guess you could say, like that. And he'd been in and out of consciousness. His ex-wife, who was a member of our church, was there, and I said, oh, can you wake him up? Does he, is he able to talk? He said, Brother Sam, you can try, because he might, he might be able to communicate with you. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I went over to his little frail body, probably didn't weigh 100 pounds, and I shook his shoulder gently, and I called out, Roy, only real loud, you know. And I called his name out, and, and Roy opened his eyes, and he looked at me. I said, Roy, I'm your daughter's preacher. Do you remember me, Brother Sam? Yeah, yeah. I said, well, Roy, I'm here to talk to you. They say you're not getting out of this room. You're about to die. He said, that's what they tell me. He said, that's what they tell me. He's real weak, could barely talk. That's what they tell me. I said, Roy, you promised me before you died, you'd call on Jesus. And you and I have been through this. Your daughters have been through it with you. The pastor before me, whose name also was Sam, had gone through the gospel with you. And now, Roy, you promised before you die. Friend, you're dying. Are you ready to call on Jesus and get saved? And I was so sure he would. And his countenance changed, and his tone changed. He said, no, no. My knees got weak. No, Roy, and I started peeling with him. Remember, remind him, you're a man of integrity. You said you keep your word. You gave me your word. Before you pass him his life, you'd call on Jesus. No. And went out. And I waited a while, went back and tried again. Roy, shaking his little shoulder gently, calling his name out. And I couldn't get him awake. And I couldn't get him awake. 
And finally, I just decided I'm just going to pray. I told his wife, you know, I'm going to pray for him. And I prayed for, uh, loud enough for people four doors down to hear the prayer because I was hoping to get through. And maybe that if he had any consciousness, he would humble his heart and be saved. And I prayed, and I couldn't get him awake again, and I, I left. Before I could get down to the elevator, I heard a commotion behind me. Look, and the light was flashing on his door. People were going into the room, and I hurried back there, and I stood outside the door until they started coming out and said, he's gone. He's gone. Think about it. The last, as far as I know, the last words out of his mouth were, no, with an attitude to the grace of God that brings salvation. I said to the love of God that would, by the blood of Jesus, pay for all his sin. And his attitude was, no, defiant. Is that a hard heart? Or is that a hard heart? It's tough. And Butch sitting right over here. His wife had gotten saved and baptized. Two, maybe three of his children, my wife could tell you, got saved and baptized. And the gospel came to Butch's house. But Butch wasn't saved, but he was coming. He was sitting right about where the guy with the bow tie is sitting right there. And he was sitting over there on this right side. And I'm preaching away, and, and I've very seldom seen it. Maybe others have seen it more. You know, I've heard all my life about they're grabbing hold of the back of the pew and their knuckles are white. I hadn't seen that two times in my whole life. But it, I saw it was Butch. And he was sitting there, and I'd give the invitation after preaching, and Butch would sit there. He'd look up and look down and look up and look down. And you could, I mean, even at times shake, hanging on so tight. So close to getting saved. One day we went through a great service and he walked out the door and wasn't saved and he got in his pickup truck and started driving away and one of the last ones to leave and as he was driving away I'm standing there thinking oh man I wish Bush would have got saved today. It was such a wonderful service and others got saved and Butch backed up. He backed his pickup up to where I was standing at the end of a sidewalk. He backed up. I thought oh hallelujah. Had his window down on his old pickup and I said, Butch, it's time to get saved, isn't it? And he's just looking down. And I said, Butch, look at me. He wouldn't look at me. I said, Butch, it's time for you to humble yourself and call on Jesus. You know, we've talked about it. I've preached about it. You know God's dealing with you. Butch, you need to get saved. Today, tears dropping into his lap. Butch, you need to call on the Lord. I'll pray for you. I'll pray with you. But you need to call on the Lord and get this settled and trust Jesus right now. And he put the pickup in gear and drove off. But he was back next Sunday. But he wasn't back next Sunday. Oh, he sat in the same place. I preached. We did everything we usually did. But Butch was there, but he wasn't there. He suddenly gained an interest in how many lights are in the ceiling. You know? He suddenly gained an interest in talking to his kids while the preaching's going on. He'd do anything except look up at the pulpit and make eye contact or let the preacher make eye contact with him. He'd do anything. That went on a Sunday, two Sundays, three Sundays, four Sundays, and then he wouldn't come. And I'd go by his house, and he'd tell, me, tell his wife, tell him I'm not here. I knew he's lying. I'd go back around the backyard uninvited to his shop and bang on the door, Butch, I know you're in there. He wouldn't answer. Then he was gone. The word came by. He could see if he wanted to see. I said he could hear if he wanted to hear. He could believe if he would believe. He chose not to. Until he could come to church the next four or five Sundays, go through the same type of services that used to put him under great conviction, and it would pour off of him like water on concrete. He had no interest, no response, no nothing. Wayside heart. If somebody's in this room today and you've said no to the gospel, even if, you, even if others might think you're saved and you know you're not, 
But if you've never truly received Jesus to be your Savior, you've never come to God by faith and repentance of your sin and faith in Jesus Christ, if you have never genuinely received Jesus to be your Savior, I'm going to tell you, you're trifling with your soul and you're trifling with your heart in a way you may not understand because to hear, come on, I'm not making this up. This is what Jesus taught. To hear and to say no. To hear and to say no. To hear and to say no. And the next time you know, that heart that could have received the soil is wayside heart. And the seed has no bearing. You want to be careful. But I'm going to close with this. Beyond that, my friend, I thought about it this way. I've received far more, I have been exposed far more to the seed, which is the Word of God. I've been exposed far more since I've been saved than before I was saved. Most of you that are saved have been exposed to far more of the Word of God, which is the seed, since you've been saved than before you got saved. And I've sought and sought. Maybe somebody could help me. I've sought and sought thinking why hearing the word of God only to reject it, well, that wouldn't have the same effect on a believer's heart. I can't find that anywhere. You got to remember that nation of Israel, they were God's covenant people. And their heart grew that hard. And I wonder how many times there are people that know the Lord. Oh, they could take you back right now. Tell their testimony. I got saved here. This is when I trusted Jesus. Oh, I know I got saved. Oh, yes, everything was different. Yes, I trusted him to be my... I was baptized. I identified with him in baptism. Oh, yes. And I said in the word, yeah, I did that for a long time. I was on fire for God and I loved the Lord. Yes, sir. Reed. What's going on now? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's like a man that told a pastor friend of mine. He said... Uh, uh, an acquaintance of a friend of mine. He said to his pastor, Pastor, I know you're concerned about me because I resigned as a deacon. I know you're concerned because I dropped out of the choir. I know you're concerned because I don't go soul winning with you anymore. I know you're concerned because it seems like I just come to church and find my seat and sit down and pay no attention. And he said, I know you're concerned about that, Pastor, but that's where I am. And here's what happened. He said, at a critical time of my life, when my business and my career and my financial picture and future was right where I wanted it to be. In fact, I was ahead of schedule. Right then, God asked me to take a step of obedience in following him that would have changed my whole financial career, my whole business career. It would have changed everything. And I said, I'm not willing to do that. I told him no. Then I'd come to church and you'd preach about it. The pastor said, well, no, I know you weren't meaning to preach about it. It's just what I heard. And I heard the same from every missionary that came through. And I heard the same from every revival speaker we had. And he said, here's what happened. I got so weary of hearing Familiar truth that I had no intention to obey. That I just got to where I could come to church, hear nothing, see nothing, and feel nothing. And the only reason I come is I don't want to disappoint my wife anymore and she's already disappointed. I don't want to be a worse example to my kids than I already am. That's the only reason I come. But I can come to church, see nothing, Hear nothing, feel nothing. It, how did this, how did that happen? God said, come here, no. Do this, no. Obey me, no. Love me, no. Tithe, no. Give to missions, no. Witness to people, no. Whatever it is. Just say no. I said, just say no to God. Come on. By his grace, he passes by with his word. He passes over a heart that rejects it instead of receives it. And something happens to the heart. To where one can see nothing, hear nothing, feel nothing.
wayside heart. Could it happen to an unsaved man like Roy and Butch? Oh, it did. Can it happen to a believer? It does. A preacher prayed in a servant recently, Brother Gillett, and he said, God, I pray that when this service is over tonight, I pray that no heart will walk out the door like they came in. And I said to myself, you don't even have to pray that because no heart will leave like they came in. We'll either hear the word and receive it and our heart will be better or we'll hear the word and reject it and a process is on. But you won't leave the same. Serious business. Somebody said, well, it sounds like once your heart gets hard, there's no hope. There isn't, except for this. God said, I'm the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. I dwell in the high and holy place. And with him also that is of a humble spirit and a broken heart. To revive the heart of the humble and to revive the spirit of the contrite one. Ah, when people will humble themselves before God, he is the God who dwells in the high and holy place, but also with those that will humble themselves before me. If you're sitting there today, please don't miss this, I'm done. If you're sitting there today and you think, All right, I don't even feel like going down there and I know my heart is hard and I know it's cold, but it has to do with circumstances and making all these excuses, then come down and tell God. God, my heart is so hard, I didn't even want to come down and bow before you. But can you do anything if I humble myself before you? God said, I can revive your heart. If I humble myself, oh God, I'm sorry that I ever let my life get this way. Contrition. God said, oh yeah. I can revive the heart of the contrite ones. I can revive the spirit of the humble and make their heart soft again. Hey, he, he can and he has and he does for whoever will humble himself before him. Oh God, may we understand the wayside heart, how it gets there your mind toward it and what can be done about it. I pray for the unction and the working of the Holy Spirit. If there's somebody here not saved, may they not say, no, no. Oh, they may say it gently now, but the heart's changing. The opportunities are passing. I pray, God, for those that were without Jesus that they would be saved today and just come and say, oh, God, to the best of my ability, I want to receive the word, the truth of who Jesus is and what he did to forgive me of my sin. I want that. I receive it. May there be believers in this room who know as well as they know their name. I've gotten complacent, hard-hearted, indifferent. It's like the word bounces right off of me. <laughs> oh, may they hear what's going through their mind even while I pray. May your Holy Spirit, oh God, may your Holy Spirit convict that hard heart. May there be humility before you and you can revive the heart of the humble. You can revive the spirit of that contrite one. Now bless this invitation for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? We're going to have a time of invitation. So we'll just let the invitation begin. The altar's open. And you say, I need, I need to be saved, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. But look, friend, if you're here today and you're without Jesus and salvation, there's somebody here with their Bible that can show you how you can know that you have eternal life. If you're here and you've been playing some kind of game and you know you're not saved, even though others think you are and your name might be on a church roll here or somewhere else, but you know you're not saved, would you hear what's happening to your heart from the words of God? It's getting hard. Wayside hard. It gets wayside hard. If you're here as a believer, hey, this invitation, sure enough, is for anybody that wants to receive Jesus and be saved.
This invitation is for anybody who may be at even the very early stages of just saying no about this issue or that issue or another issue in your life. And while that is happening, your heart is changing. And sometimes it might be so subtle you would even be in denial of it. Yeah. Serious business. It truly is. Right now. Let's have the invitation. Sing it.